Thank you so much, Candice. Thank you so much for having me here today. Um, so yeah, uh, so today we're going to talk everything about, you know, how do you configure a high performance um, streaming services on top of Kubernetes. And um, just a little bit about me, uh, for you, those of you who don't know about me, I am a developer advocate who is currently working in Red Panda. Um, so my previous experience was very heavily on Java. So I did a bunch of SOA in the back days where I did a lot of um, Java programming and, you know, have a lot of um, experience with mess IBM and um, messaging queues as well, web spheres. And then I moved on to, my, uh, to doing something that's more open source because uh, I like the community. I like, I like to interact with people, um, especially working with smart people. Uh, in the community. So that's why I started using JBoss and then I got introduced to Camel. So I did a bunch of work on Camel, also becoming one of the uh, the person that talks about Camel on the internet as well. And then I started using, you know, like it's unavoidable that when you do integrations, you have to do a lot of asynchronous work. And that, and when Kafka first started it, that's when I started to kind of work with Kafka. And now I'm with Red Panda. So I think for us, it's kind of building that, you know, live data stack where everything's just moved really fast. Um, so that's kind of our version of here, uh, over here. So I'm kind of happy to be uh, working with Red Panda on kind of uh, helping people to build that stack. So um, today we're going to talk uh, a a lot about the networking on top of Kubernetes. Uh, feel free to drop in any questions. I will try to answer them as much as possible. Um, and also, you know, I love to hear your thoughts afterwards. It's if it it will it'll be good if we can connect on LinkedIn and let me know your thoughts. You know, what do you think about today's uh, session? Do you do you think it's hard? Do you think it's too simple? Let me know. I'd love to adjust my content next time for you as well. Um, just a little bit note here. Um, so I'm talking about streaming services on top of Kubernetes, all the networking related contents, you know. Um, so basically I'm going to cover some of the basics of the the basics on Kubernetes networking. Um, and it applies to both Red Panda and Kafka as well. So this is not just for Red Panda, but if you're using Kafka already, I think some of the most of the aspect would be reply uh would be related to you. Um, so I just want to bring out a quick pull um of your background to kind of let us know a little bit about you. You know, what's your uh, where are you in your data streaming adoptions? Are you just looking or are you currently looking into adopting one? You're using it already in uh, development or using in production? I want to hear your level and, you know, it'd be good to kind of have some veteran as well to kind of discuss things with me. Love to hear your thoughts too. All right. Shameless plug here. Um, just a little bit about Red Panda. So Red Panda is a drop 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 in replacement for Kafka. So basically, what you can do is just take the Kafka off from your data stack and then put Red Panda in. It will just work. Basically, the entire protocol and API is exactly the same. But what's the difference between Red Panda and Kafka? It is they're both streaming services. Um, I think it's the the way of implementations. Um, I'm a geek, so I like to geek out on the fundamental. Um, difference between um, the two pieces of technology. Um, and that is why uh, from Red Panda's perspective, because everything was written in C++, therefore there's a not, a, not a lot of like virtualization layers on top of everything. So if you look at Kafka, how it was implemented, it was great technology, great ideas and great everything. Um, the, the implementation was based on uh, JVM, so it's in Java and Scala. So, um, so everything, it has this virtualization layer of memory, um, optimized memory management. So basically everything has to go through JVM, therefore introduce a layer of uh, management you need to take care of so things like garbage collections and all stuff like that and also um, like when things gets written into the disk it uses the page page cache provided by the operating system which provides another layer of caching and management as well um, but compared to what Red Panda does is we wrote everything in C++. Therefore, we don't have to go through a lot of like the virtualization layers. We directly control the memories. Um, the way that we implement how things work, we use C star framework, basically recruit as much as the CPU powers as possible to work on um, streaming your data instead of the uh, where the other solutions more like, okay, so you know, the CPU is shared by a lot of different applications. Um, therefore, you got to have to do a lot of context switching in your uh, in your um, in your CPU level in order to get to that point. We'll introduce a little bit of the um, uh, of the resource uh, as well. You got to use resource to do that. So 
that's why um, Red Panda was, when it did start developing, it used, it was thinking about the hardware in mind. So that is why it's a, a lot faster um, streaming platform um, out, out of the box when when um, when you kind of do your streamings. Just some shameless plug here, but I do like to geek out on technology and that's why I want to talk about it. But let's back, get back to our topics here. Um, so networkings and data is on top of um, Kubernetes, right? But let's go back to the fund fundamentals. So why don't we just use HTTP because Kubernetes is not, is, is infamous on doing, um, you know, basic level different protocols. Um, it's really good for HTTP, ser HTTP services, HTTP protocols, but it's not very good at, you know, dealing with other protocols. Um, but why do we want to do that? Well, the reason behind it is because, you know, how the, the fundamental of the communication works, right? So, I mean, of course, HTTP is, is working on your layer seven where, so basically the older version, not like the HTTP three, but like the older versions of HTTP um, protocol, you have to have your initial handshake and then you have to do a lot of like request response um, in between that. So basically when every time it gets to um, your destination of your source, you know, where everything is, it, then your client issues a request, it has to wait for a response back from your server side in order to proceed to the next one. So there's a lot of time loss if, if you have a large amount of data. But when you are working with um, a sp specific protocols like Kafka's protocol, so by the way, Rependa uses the same protocol as well, exactly the same. Um, so basically what happens is that it allows multiplexing because it uses a lower, le lower level TCP layer four um, communication. And therefore you can do a lot of multiplexing, meaning that you can send your data directly without waiting uh, for your response to get back, which is a lot more efficient if you think about how many data uh, the amount of data you're trying to transfer. So you don't have to, to wait for the act to come back in order to send to the next one because you know everything will be going to, you have to transfer everything over anyway. Um, and another thing is the wait time, right? So for request response, like the typical behavior is synchronous in HTTP perspective because, you know, you issue a request uh, to a web server, the web server enters everything and it comes back and gives you an answer, right? And that's kind of like a typical way of like how HTTP works. Um, with all that um, come back, right? But with streaming services, you don't actually need to, you know, wait for everything to be confirmed in order to send the next packet um, over the internet. So, um, and then what happens after that doesn't really matter from the sender's perspective because the sender is just thinking about how do I get this data over to the other side? And that is all I worry about. Um, so basically what happens here is that it, it uses this asynchronous way of communications where, um, the, the streaming platform, Kafka or Red Panda, whatever is the medium of um, place where it's the, the middle point where it stores, temporarily stores your data somewhere. And then the rest of the other applications like microservices, your connectors or whatever, like your data pipelines, whatever you're trying to send it over, well then can pick it up later on. So it's doing things asynchronously. So it, first of all, it allows you to do a lot better with the scaling with like, and then allow it to broadcast to different users. We're still talking about basic stuff, right? But how do you do like um, how do you do scaling in terms of um, these two different types of protocols? Well, for HTTP, the, the typical way of doing things is adding a, a, a layer seven, you know, load balancers, application level load balancers, where it will just run Robin or you know, sticky stick. Uh, having a sticky sessions where you'll just send your request back to your server. So the client actually doesn't know about how many servers are you serving. Um, so if you're trying to balance uh, really, really balance out the load. It's really hard to predict because your your client has no idea how busy things are on the other side of the store. So basically, this is how it scales. But with with um, Kafka protocols or streaming protocols, things like that, you're gonna have your client um, connect to every single one of the brokers that's available that has all the data. So actually the client is responsible for doing the load balancing. The client needs to know a lot. So that is why you have more uh, flexibilities in terms of how do you want to distribute the data and how do you want to consume them? Basic different ideas. And that is why it introduced a little bit of, of, of a complexity when it comes to you know networking inside Kubernetes, right? Um, and then when you're trying to do data ingestions into um Remember when I talk about, you know, how do I do, you know, scale out uh, from the date, uh, from the broker's perspective, this is how it, this is what happens, right? So basically um, you have three different brokers, for instance, in this case, right? 
And the clients will then start streaming data into um, into 3 dimensional brokers. The way it does that is that it connects to every single brokers, but it is not going to write everything into one single place because that is going to be a single point of failure. Therefore, it will then choose different partitions to hold different places. Say, um, for this particular topic from offset zero to offset, you know, or number ID number zero to number 100, I'm going to write it to here. From 100 to 200, I'm going to write it over to here. And then from 200 to 300, I'm going to write it over here. So it knows the range. And if it falls into the same range, that will be going to a different brokers. So everything gets um, evenly distributed over to the um, the broker itself. But we still have to think about how do we overcome you know single point of failures. If something goes wrong with this broker, um, your data is lost. And you know, having your things distributed in different places, not, not missing a piece of information is probably not very good for, you know, catching up on your data. So the way that, you know, um, all the streaming platform does is that they do replications. So basically when the data, when the producer writes the data into a certain broker, the broker then will start initiating something called replication. And these replication gets replicated into the other. So depending on how the replication factors that you said, if you want to say, I, I want a replication factor for two, that means that it will send two extra copies of the data um, to somewhere else in the um, in the in in the cluster. Basically, cluster is how you have multiple brokers inside a cluster that forms like a group of broker that's serving the same thing, right? So basically, you just distribute all the data over to the other brokers, and the same to the other partitions that you have. So it will then all your brokers will have the the data, but actually the, the depending on the um, partitions like which partitions you are in it will then different um brokers will become the leader the leader is where the data gets writes in and this is where the data is going to be read from um so basically that's kind of um how everything does and because of this nature and the nature of what we have with you know different protocols that makes things a little bit more complex um when you try to set things up so when we set up a client uh, from the Kafka side uh, or from the Red Panda side, a client trying to access data from your streaming platform, what happens is your broker needs to set up a bootstrap server. A bootstrap server can be any broker inside the clusters that you have. So basically you just tell your client that uh, your client's like, okay, this is one of the broker that you're gonna connect it to. So here's the address and go do your job. So basically the clients will then start up and then contact the broker A or because I'm setting broker A as its, its bootstrap server. And the broker A is going to give the client a set of metadata and information about the other brokers that is available in the cluster. So the client will have an idea of, okay, so now you have like three brokers. That means that I need to contact all these three brokers and establish a connection to these brokers. And these connections will stay up live and then um, it will be sending out data according to the petitions that it's trying to send, right? So that is how it works. That is how client knows about everything in your brokers. So everything's great. Um, but what happens is, you know, like, you know, we're doing a lot of replications internally. So if everything is within your, um, within your network, everything's great because inside your network, your intranetwork that, you know, everybody will get their internal addresses, IP addresses, you know, they all know each other. They know when they all know where they're located at. So they will be replicating everything because they know all know each other. Um, and then if your client is inside the same like same network, that is also fine because basically you, uh, you're just connecting directly to one of your brokers as well. The problem is when your client is outside of the same, of the network. It's outside of your company. It's somewhere in the public. It is trying to access your brokers, right? But it doesn't have access to your broker's address because if you give its internal IP address, this broker won't know where to go. This broker will like, I have no idea where to go. Um, I don't know where you are. Um, so basically what you need to do is you need to expose a external, you need to kind of have that internet, that, that network interface exposed to the public 
so that the client would know how to contact these broker outside of your workspace. So, when, so that's when you have to set advertised addresses in order, so the advertised address would be this address instead of the internal addresses so that the client then would be able to connect to um, the broker that you have internally inside your network. That is the important part. Many people, when they first got introduced to the streaming platform, they don't know what advertised address is. So a lot of them wasn't able to connect to um, the broker. And the reason is always about, you know, where they are, where the, how do you locate it? And they didn't realize that, you know, the um, the client was was getting this advertised address from the bootstrap server. If you have it wrong, then your client won't be able to connect to it. That was the whole reason behind it. So speaking of networks, that was just a bunch of you know VMs or bare metal ma machines inside your um, inside your network, which is like okay, fine. Um, but on top of that, you know, like Kubernetes is adding another virtualization layers on top of your virtualization layers. So how do I get to get from you know, and then running a streaming services is like running a container inside your up inside your environment, and then everything was kind of like man managed by this Kubernetes cluster. So how do I get my client, which is outside of this Kubernetes cluster and trying to connect back to the clusters, Kubernetes clusters that you have, we have to learn about the Kubernetes networking. It is not as easy. So I think if you, if you think about it as, as a uh, normal internet setup, it'll be easy to understand, but it took me a while to kind of figure things out. So I want to share that with you on my understanding of how it works and hope, hopefully that helps you as well. So with Kubernetes, you have a lot of nodes. Nodes mean meaning that they are VMs or machines that's running your Kubernetes. Um, so they're worker nodes, they're just running things, right? So your container, which is um, a, a container image that is running, it will be running in one of the node that you know you have assigned it to and they are referred as pod of course you can have multiple containers in the pod but we're not going to talk about it today but we have a pod that every pod will, every container will be in the pod pod is like a way that you can manage like a um spinning up spinning down things on top of kubernetes but these pods or containers are informal right meaning that they can be done and they can be up any single time, like whatever. If something goes wrong, Kubernetes, Kubernetes is going to destroy it and, and you know, bring it back up again. So that is how things work in Kubernetes. And that is why I said, you know, Kubernetes is great for, state, for stateless application because it doesn't really care, like, you know, if what's the state. If, if, if something goes wrong, then you'll just bring it back up again and it will just work. You know, like how we, when, like, remember the old time when you have some problem with, it, with your computer, you just restart it. That's kind of the idea, right? Restart it. But the problem is when you have some stateful information, if you want to keep, remember what's going on before you turn things off, then you have a problem. Because once you restart everything, then your everything was lost. So same thing here. Um, so if I, if I, I stopped everything from this container, um, and then I bring up a new one, I have a new IP. So does that mean that if my application, if, if my client is trying to connect to this pod, I couldn't constantly change my IP because then, you know, it's there's a lot of configuration changes on top of for my clients, right? So probably not so well. And then if we have so many, if we in, in the Kubernetes world, we have a lot of pods, containers running inside the Kubernetes space. And then, you know, these are all pods. So how do I locate everything? Um, how do I let Kubernetes know? And how do I let the other knows about things, right? So this is this is where um, it gets interesting. So when so what you have to do is you have to create this thing called service, where this service will then assign a virtual IP for a pod inside your Kubernetes network. So basically, it's a virtualized IP that can be located or used within the network, and people will know what that is. And then what's going on is that it will then go to the Kubernetes API controller, which is in the management level, where it is then then it's going to say, hey, I have this new pod running in this node and it is um, it is using this virtual IP. Then the Kubernetes API server is going to talk to the kube proxy. The proxy, the kube proxy 
is a Kubernetes agent that installs on top of every on top of your all your nodes. So, you, so basically, what they do is their do their, their their job is very similar to IP table in Linux terms, where it has this mapping of addresses and IP addresses. They would know where they are um, and then how to call it. So basically, they would have that virtual IP addresses map to that particular pod inside your node along with you know different settings like port and stuff like that so what we can we can take a look at the example later on but this is what's going on so this procure proxy becomes the, like an address book on top of your kubernetes um node then this is how when every single time when there's a request goes into the into your node the cool proxy will look it up and says oh you're looking for this particular address services oh that's fine this is this virtual ip and this is where exactly it what where it was and on top of that you can add some uh, networking policies on top of that um and then it will then refer transfer the traffic back to your pod and that's how you use it everything's great inside a kubernetes server but um if my client is outside of kubernetes server um then I cannot use the internal IPs or internal addresses in order to locate my services. So what do I do? Well, you've got two options there, right? The first option is use a node port. The node port, what it means is that it is going, so every single one of your node will then get an external facing public, um, public addresses, IPs, exported ex outside of your Kubernetes services. And this public IP will then be used uh, from your client in, in order to access your pod. And that's how it uses it. So basically, when you say, I want to know port services, what happens is that it will then, okay, says, okay, every single pod there that runs this service, uh, no, every single node there that runs the services, you're going to attach the services to one, any one of your port randomly. You can do that randomly or you can assign one. And that needs to be between like uh, 30,000 and um, this number here, I think I have it down below. Um, exactly, like they will randomly choose that and then that they would attach that particular service and the particular port into that. And then you can you can use that external IP of the particular node or particular machines. Um, and then you can access that into, into where they are. Another way of doing that is using load balancer. Low balancer, what happens is that it will create a load balancer uh, and then have attached that to a external load balancers and they would directly, and then it will use that load balancer. So each external load balancers would, would have its direct IPs. So this service will then says, okay, so if everything coming from that particular external load balancers will then go through that, it will go into the service load balancers and it will then use Coop, Coop proxy to look up, okay, this services is coming from load balancer and this is this is the services that attach, attaches to and then it will relay the traffics over here. That's basically how things work in Kubernetes. And if you think about how things work in the cloud, it's not a lot of a difference. Um, so I'm taking uh, AWS as an example, but things similar things are similar in uh, for Google G G GKE and AKS. It's very similar. It's just the things are a little bit different um, on the naming side of the stories, right? They have a router. They have different low, uh, cloud road balancer. They name it differently. That's it. But um, in terms of using node port, basically what happens is that this IP address will then get re rerouted to the route. So when traffic comes in from the routes, it gets directly routed to the uh, instance, the EC2 instance that you're running into, or like in, in AWS's term, like the actual instance running to, and with its port, it gets access to the service. But if you're running through load balancer, basically what happens is that when you, every time when you establish a load balancer, it will then create a cloud load balancers depending on your providers, and then these gets attached to the route. So every single single time when you call this load balancers, it gets forwarded into your Kubernetes. And that is the basics of Kubernetes networking. I hope that helps. Right. And then this is what I forgot the title. All right. So this is what um Red Panda looks like when it, you deploy it on top of the uh on top of Kubernetes. Like every other data related project, Kafka, databases, whatever that needed to, to remember the state, 
you always use that we always have the staple sets available. The reason behind it is because we need to pick up from where everything was. So we need to know, so when we use stateful sets to deploy our brokers, we'll have default numbers assigned or default names assigned to each broker. So if, if broker one died, I would have to you know restart broker one and then attach broker one back to its configurations and its, its storages underneath the hood, also attach it back to the services that it was originally exporting to. Therefore, um, things can come back up again. You cannot randomly start up another set of, you know, another set of um, pods, PVs, PVCs, because it will be completely empty and it is going to take forever to think, pick things up. So in Red Panda's way, I think it's very similar to Kafka, where Kafka has Streamzy, but Red Panda, we have our own operators. So basically it does the same thing where you just define a set of custom resource definitions, describe how you want to deploy your streaming services on top of Kubernetes and the operator is going to take over and deploy everything for you. So you don't have to do, you don't have to, you know, do everything yourself. You don't have to define your safe set. You don't have to define your PVs, PVCs, prod deployment, everything like that. It just does it for you. So that is what's going on. So I'm going to do a quick demo on how we do things um, in uh, Red Panda. It's very similar to uh, to what you would do with Streamzy, but basically what happens here is I have already defined a no port configurations. So this configuration is a CRD, which I kind of define a, a CR, custom resource, where I define, I want to have three, uh, three brokers installed on my Kubernetes clusters and how I want to export it with networking is through no port. And I want to have a domain name for that. And that that is my own domain name. And then the rest is kind of like, I'm just turning off all the TLS, like the security stuff to make things simple. But if you want to hear more about security, we can talk about it later next time. And then a little bit about storage as well. Like here, how much, how much storage space do I want to have for my particular um, brokers? Kind of it, and then adding a console so you can kind of see things happening. That is what's uh, how I kind of uh, deploy my content, uh, deploy my cluster. And let me move things over. Uh, Zoom is taking a lot of my space. Um, okay, perfect. So this is the cluster that I just deployed. So you can see I have three different running brokers and it is a empty broker. Nothing is in there, right? So if you take a look at my, um, my, my cluster here, you see that I have a three. So I, I already deployed this um, ahead of time, but it, because it takes about three or four minutes to deploy everything, but this is what's going on. It will deploy um, different pods, right? And what is the interesting part here is the actual services that it creates. As you can see, it actually creates a no port service. Well, let's take a look at the no port service. Why don't we do that? This is the no port services that it creates, right? The interesting part is, okay, first of all, we've got a assign a cluster IP where this is where it's locating. And then I have something that's fun, which is the no port mapping. So you know how many how in in um streaming services we always export to different port, admin port, and then the actual port that does all the transfers of data, right? These are the two, the fundamental ones that we have. So these are all exported by the port from port, specific port internally. But if we want to ex export externally, what happens is now I have um, two different, uh, I'm exporting it on a different port. So this is the port that was attached to the public available IP addresses. So if you want to know, okay. So if we want to know about all the nodes and the um, IP address, this is how I can find out. So for the node, this is the uh, the node of um, the instances I'm running on. So I also have three worker nodes on my Kubernetes. They all run on these three IP address. So these are the node port. These are the machine IP, external IPs that I was exposed to in the internet. And you can see that all my different red pandas are running on 
different nodes, right? Because I have set the affinity to have all my my pen, Red Panda broker deploy on different nodes. So they all spread across different nodes. So basically, this is what's going on. So they all have the no port assigned and then have the no port uh, created. So basically, what I have to do is I can now um, I can now kind of add it to my DNS. So this is my DNS server. Um, basically, what I did was I I like to hide things under I like to hide the um, the these like configuration details from my client, so my client doesn't have to change everything. Everything is underneath the hood. So I always use my DNS server to kind of hide everything. And this is my DNS server, so it's just kind of forwarding to see if it's forwarding to these different uh different nodes here right so it's it's forwarding over things to that so what i can do now is i can now talk to the server um by using the ips right but let's think about what we talked about the um the advertise address let's just get the advertise address so this is we can kind of we can do a quick curl on you know asking for this is the things that you'll get for I'm asking a broker like okay what's the information is there and then the broker is gonna return with you with all the node configurations that you need to know the client needs to know so we can see that all right so the advertise advertise a address from the client to get to there's two of them one is internal use internal only though this one is used by the internal user if you're in the um in the same Kafka or in the same Kubernetes space, this is the URL that you will be using. And if you're if you're con if you're connecting outside, if you're if you're connecting um from outside, this is the URL that you will be using. And therefore, that is how my client knows it needs to talk to this red panda and then gets forward to the ones in my Kubernetes space. And that is how it works. So I can do a quick RPK topic. Create this. And what happens now is that it's going to create a topics inside my uh inside my uh inside my cluster and I can start sending um produce Hello. And then if I refresh, I can see the hello that goes in. So this is actually connecting to the clusters using the no port with the um, TCP packets and everything. So that's how we do things in um, no port, right? And remember the part where I talk about, you know, um, setting the DNS. This is how you can set. Um, here, this is how I can set my domains so that these domains are uh, returned by the broker. So the broker does need to know your domain address in order to return the right uh, addresses. Similar to load balancers. Load balancers are similar, very similar to what the others are doing. So basically what I need to do, I've already set up a load balancer over here. Um, the only difference, if you're coming from a custom resource perspective, it is only uh, it, it 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 only needs this the uh, load balancer changes. So basically, I'm changing from using no port to using load balancers. So I am going to apply this change. Red panda apply the chef. Low balance. And it is now going to upload these configurations over to the uh, to my cluster. And my Kubernetes cluster is going to detect this change. My operator would know. And then it will look at these configurations and say, OK, these are the changes I need to make. And then we'll, it will start apply the changes. And let's take a look at the um, results. So if we take a look at all the things that has been deployed below, you can see that things are a little bit different now. Not only I don't have that external exposed uh, services anymore, I now have three different load balancer services created on behalf of me, right? So what happens is now the, um, the operator knows that, okay, I need the load balancers 
And this is how it then creates low balancers. If you take a look at one of these, um, uh, if you take a look at one of these low balancers, it will then says, yes, I will need low balancers. Um, and this is what happens, right? And then you will have a low balancer attaches to it. So what is this low balancer here? Simple. So if you go to our, um, this is my AWS account. So I've been using this to spin up my, I, I have my EKS running and all that. So this is origin, This is what I had before. This is just a low balancer. So that's my my uh, Nginx um, Ingress controller or Ingress, uh, Ingress uh services that I started it. So I'm, I was using that to export export my uh, consoles and everything, right? So that's HTTP things. Um, but now I wanna have um, three more that was created for me. So what happens is now if I click refresh, there you go, you can see there are three other um, load balancers. So basically what you saw was kind of what I had um, the, um, the net, the, when I started a low balancer, it creates a a, a, a call called low balancers for me, and then they each would have a publicly accessible addresses. So what I'm going to do is I am going to get all the services first. I need to map all. Oh, I can't see. Um, so I need I want to map all these addresses over with my DNS, so I don't have to change things. So I'm just gonna go ahead and change my DNS, forward it over to the new URL that I, I got from uh, AWS. These are cloud low balancers, right? Do that quickly. Do that and save. And this is going to update my records. I'm going to uh, wait for a couple of minutes for it to kind of capture, update everything on the DNS side. But um, before, while we're waiting, um, I think it's important to talk about um, the types of load balancers that your um, cloud providers provide you. So the cloud providers gets you, gives you, um, gives you different types of gateways. Um, or, or or low balancers. And as you can see, the low balancers that I have got from here, these are called classic um, low balancers from um, AWS. So this classic um, low balance network low balancer is a, a both it supports both layer seven and layer four. So if you look at their documentations, it's actually not that efficient for um, traffics, like streaming services, because we go on the layer four level, right? So in order for us to be more efficient, I think it'd be great if you can uh, spin up a network load balancer instead of the you know the classic one where it supports both. The network one would support both just the layer four communications. So it was it will be a lot more quicker, a lot more better. Um, and the way to do that is to spin up a network load balancer. And for the network load balancer, this is um, how you do it with AWS. Um, obviously for GKEs and AKS, it's uh, very similar. I think it's just changing the different names to that and they will just know what type of load balancers that it spins up. But when you use this term terminologies, like adding, basically just added annotations on top of your um, services, then it would know. Um, it will then spin up a network load balancer. I can share this code with you later on uh, with my Git. Um, but um, it's very simple, basically. So what happens now is, should I, do I have access to my uh, cluster now? Let me see. Yes, now I'm talking to uh, our, my cluster through the through this um, new load balancers. Oh, I should have done it when it's, when it's not working, but what, you have to trust me on that. Uh, all right, so this is how I, you, how I trend, how, how everything works internally and externally for the um, the traffics inside load balancer. And also, if you take a look at the uh, the configuration, it's gonna tell you that you know here are the things. 
We can always change it to using this URL as well, um, but we're not gonna do that this time because of the time concern, but I can make a video if you want to kind of dive into a little bit deeper into things, but that is how we can do configurations with load balancers. Um, yeah, so a little bit about load balancers. Uh, another of questions that I got get asked often is about the CNI plugins. So these CNI plugins got really popular um, for the from for the last two years, one year, two years or so. Um, people often ask me like, okay, so what kind of like C CNI plugin would be better for streaming services? So I actually did some low um, testing. I did a uh, I did a benchmarking thing for from uh, just do a quick testing like if which one of these are faster. So actually, you'll be surprised. Uh, Maybe I maybe I tested raw. I'd love to hear your feedback on that. But when I tested um the load, it actually doesn't make any difference, even if I introduce or not introduce CNI, right? And I think it's because how CNI works underneath the hood. Yes, it, it would introduce faster time to look up. It will allow you to do better networking policies and it will allow you to see more things in the in the networking space. So this CNI plugin is another layer where Depends on what what kind of um, plugins that you use, some of them will then replace that cool proxy. So that cool proxy is probably one of the point where things get slower, right? Um, so because the way that it does, it uses like IP tables. So if you're using IP tables, then like you know every single time when you have a new connection comes in, it needs to look up all the things on the IP tables, go through everything. Um, so it's like the word, it's pretty slow. You can probably use IPVS as well, but you know, it's similar things. So you need to look out things. Um, and then you can, and it's hard to kind of add different policies on, on top of that. So this plugin is kind of adding another layers where you can just, when every single time when something triggers in the networking side, it, it can then call this plugin to do other stuffs. Um, one of the things that is, it allows faster lookup. So you're not just relying on that IP table to look up things. It allows you to do a lot more rerouting and all that stuff, right? But the thing is, it only gets slow when you do your first lookup. So once your connection is established, it doesn't need to look up things again, right? So for um, a very stable connections like streaming services, it actually doesn't make a big difference. Like that's what I think. It doesn't make any big difference when you're, uh, when you just have a stable connection and things are starting to written into writing into it and um, not writing into it, I think that doesn't really make any and it's not making things faster. It would be good. I mean, these are good to have, right? If you have the you know capabilities, you have you know if you if you want to do that, you can. But in terms of you know making things faster, I don't think this CNI would make a huge impact on the streaming services. But on the contrary, if you have a lot of like you know services in your node, uh, and then you have a lot of hoop jumping for HTTPs, like you know your ingress HTTP services, and you have like a bunch of sidecars on your service mesh. That's a different story. But here we're talking about very stable streaming, you know, connections. That's is that that when it's established doesn't really change that much. So, in my perspective, I don't think it helps a ton. All right, some. Connectivity checkpoints, right? So um, when you have a problem with connecting to your services, make sure that you uh, you, you think about what is your advertised addresses, right? So I have a blog post that I did, um, I think a couple months ago already, is what is um, what is IP, what is advertised Kafka address, right? So. If you have a pro, if you want to know more about this, please go ahead and read it. I think the last section was about was was about Kubernetes and all the command that I shared today is mostly here, right? So you can see how everything works. It explains a little bit about Kubernetes and how worker nodes work, but it goes to the basics of you know how I work. I like to work from the basics, so I talk about how everything works from the beginning. So I would strongly to make, recommend you to read it. Um, um, to, to read it if you have problems, right? Another common problem I see people has is like um, VPCs. Um, so uh, I see people deploy their, you know, containers and their their um, Kubernetes in this VPCs and they have other clients coming, like trying to connect to this VPC, but they forgot to connect those VPCs. So there's no peering, there's no linking, there's nothing. So the, the network just, it's not connected. So you can connect it together. So try to make sure your VPC are connected through VPC peering, um, linking, or you know, 
gate, trans, transit gateway or try not to use the net gateway because it goes out to the internet and comes back again. Like why waste that traffic bandwidth, right? And slow. Um, and then, you know, if you're on the same Kubernetes cluster, what is your addresses? Is it more, more efficient you know, addresses that you have locally? So it's local services address, make sure you know. And um, some of the problem was people, when they first set up their Kubernetes, they forgot to open up the ports for the um for that for the ports for the um the port no port if you're using no port they forgot to open it so no traffic can go in and out from that no port that instance that EC2 instance so therefore you cannot connect so don't forget to to uh, take a take a look at it and then obviously like when you think about you know all the ports that is available here right you got a bunch of ports um that is available. So they all kind of meaning a different thing, right? Um, for instance, like you have the admin port, which is doing all the admin stuff. The Kafka port is actually what you want. And then because Ripenda also provides you with a lot of capabilities that's not included in, in Kafka, like um, we give you like an out of box HTTP bridge. So if you wanna if you wanna connect your streaming through HTTP bridge, that you can do that. And then also schema registries. So just make sure you're connecting the right port. These are very common things I see people ask in the community, these are all FAQs. Performances, right. Some performances impact that you can probably see uh, when you are designing and then you, when you're trying to figure out how much bandwidth do I need for my network, you have to think about this, take this into account. So when you are writing data into, into, the, um, into your brokers, X is the amount of, um, this X is the amount of data that you, you will um, be ingesting into the broker. So therefore you have X. The problem is that when, you know, depending on how much, how much replication factor, so how much, uh, how many uh, duplicate things that you want to duplicate to the other brokers, right? If you want to say, I have two, I want to duplicate to two other brokers. That means that you're introducing two traffics, like two data that gets replicated over from this broker to the other broker. So the more you replicate, the more bandwidth that you will consume. And then people don't really think about this much, but um, but when you're trying to consume your data from your brokers, I know it's tempting to have as much, as much um, consumer trying to fetch the data as much as possible, but you have to think about this. The more consumers you have, the more outgoing data you have. So this is how you can calculate, kind of estimate how much bandwidth you're probably gonna need um, in order to kind of just satisfy your needs. So if everything, everybody's like, you know, getting data in and out of that, this is how you can do that. So number of data transmitted, um, you can you need to plus the number of replicated factors and then the number of consumers. I've seen now some of our, some some customers or some people that they will be have they will have like thousands of consumers. That means that you have to have a serious good bandwidth in order to support that. Just saying. Um, so some of the configurations you can control, right? So, I mean, in the in in the streaming space, your 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 producer and your consumer is is resp is responsible for a lot of things, like determining what petitions they want to write things in, and also how many in flight concurrent requests, how concurrent requests, in flight concurrent requests that you can have. Uh, for connections. The more you have, the more data gets transferred over, right? Um, so, you know, like you can kind of see the fluctuations of your um, data bandwidth consumptions when you have more data coming, like transfer, like through the same time, right? And then the things that you can control to make um, things a lot more efficient is increase the batch size, the, be the bigger packet, the better, right? So, and also, the longer you wait, the bigger the packet. So you can kind of control it that two ways. And the other one is um, compressions. We can compress the data into and zip it, right? So so there's less data you you have to transfer over the network. But that also introduces a lot of processing on your consumer and producer side because they need to decompress it. Um, so de depending on your needs, make sure that you know um, should I compress it so I have lower network use usage or do I want to um, not compress it so that my producer and uh, consumers don't have to, to do that as much as much work. Public IP always slower. Uh, and then other things like consumers are similar to what producers, but in the other side of the story. So the bigger the packet that it fetches, the more efficient it is. So the longer it wait, the longer it is, right? Um, and then 
you know, other things like timeouts. So if your consumer is is not is not doing anything for the last minutes, many seconds, just disconnected, you know, don't waste your connection there. It's not doing anything anyway. So think about all these different um, strategies you can kind of minimize the usage. Other things that can um, impact the usage are, you know, if you're doing some benchmark or things like that, you, it's probably going to affect the network. Uh, some people go crazy on observability metrics. It's it's really happens. I, I don't think so. But if you go crazy on the um, observability metrics, of course, there's more data going in, going out, uh, gets scraped um, from your like observability tools, right? So these are also counted as bandwidth. Speaking of bandwidth, like if you're doing tier storage, Kafka doesn't do this, but Red Panda does, is that um, we help you to, uh, you know, like how Kafka works, right? It will lose all the data um, on retained data, right? So after seven days, it's going to delete everything and that thing gets deleted forever, depending on your configurations. Um, and then so Red Panda allows you to kind of have these data stored somewhere else in a much cheaper, you know, object store bucket like S3. And then when you're offloading this over to the S3 bucket, it is going to use some of, use some of your network. So you also need to uh, take, account, take in account of that. So some takeaways for the performance perspective. I, I went a little bit fast on that side. Let me know if I want to, if you want to hear deeper on that, but yeah. So um, things that uh, you want to think about, right? So the number of producer, consumer, and then the number of ratios, right? Um, how many of them were there? You have to think about it. Um, don't have too much. Don't want to do over, over provision your consumer, I would say. Um, and then uh, use large packets as possible, please. And then make sure you set up your time out when you're not doing anything, just time out. And then the replication factor is actually matter. It does matter because it will take up some of the internal um, networking space, right? Um, producer consumer configurations. These are the things that you can remember the one that we talked about, like you know, the size, um, the packet size and all that. You can kind of configure that there. Um, so I want to talk about these a limitation, um, not just EC2, but on every single one of the um, the cloud. They will promise you a capacity limits, right? So they will say up to 25 megabytes per second limitations. But it is, it is not always like... Um, 25 mega megabytes per second all the way, right? And different instances would have different um, available bandwidth. So do take into account that, you know, what kind of instance do you have? And do they have guaranteed bandwidth or do they have up to bandwidth? Because it can be very good on Monday. It could be amazing on Tuesdays, but it could be terrible on Wednesday. You never know. Um, so think about it. Um, and then take a look at it. And then some of sometimes when they promise bandwidth, it doesn't mean that it's all the way to the public space. Sometimes they will limit the bandwidth uh, from the public IPs and you know from external subnets and stuff like that. Um, and then and depending on you know also how you set up your um, HA HA uh, strategy because some of them I think a lot of people likes to have it in different partitions like um, different data centers, right? To have that high availability. So if something goes wrong, I can have that. But the thing is that when you're trying to do replications over, when you're trying to communicate through um, through the clients, these all matters, right? These are all, if you're trying to connect to a different data centers, then it's going to take longer and all that kind of stuff, right? That that takes, I mean, it's not gonna have a huge impact, but you, you will notice the difference. Um, and then, you know, um, thread load, if you, there's a, uh, if your if your consumer is consuming a huge amount of data, you know if you if you if you're hitting the streaming limits per connections, you can probably spread it around like have two uh, two consumers in the same consumer groups to share the load. Things you can do uh, to kind of make things a lot easier for um, for running your networks. And that is all from me. I hope we have some time for Q and A's, but um, here are some of the resource that is available from Red Panda side. We have university. Uh, so me and my colleagues created this university course where it teaches you fund fundamentals of red, uh, streaming services and all that. You can kind of take a look at it. We have the best documentations ever. I think we have a very good documentation team that try to put things down. And then there's a lot of information on blog posts. And then 
Uh, let me know like anything, any feedback, both on Slack or you know, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Happy to hear your thoughts. And then our informations or our uh, code is all available on the uh, in our GitHub account. So if you want to see how Repanda is made, how it's written, and all the new updates on the code itself, this is the GitHub place. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at the questions. So how how do you use Docker Compose to interact with Red Panda with Docker for, uh, for, for transitioning between Linux OS and Windows? I, to be honest with you, I'm not a Windows OS savvy person. <laughs> But I assume if the Docker Compose works the same way as the uh, how everything works on Linux or Mac OS, I think that it's easy. It will be similar to what's going on with um. I have so in my in my post um. Am I sharing? No, yeah. So in my post, I have a section on on Docker. So actually, I talk a little bit about Docker and how to use it. Right. So basically, Docker. In Docker, you have this Docker network, right? So basically, if you're trying to talk to things um, inside your Docker network, basically you have you have to see like what is the what is the address or that was bind to your Docker network, and then you need to export it. Basically, attaching a um, advertised address, which is a external um, Docker network advertised address, into your into your brokers, and that is how you can write it. Sorry, I'm not a Windows expert, but love to hear your thoughts. If I get my hands on on window machines, I will try and let you know. Um, any issues metrics using method on ARM processors? No, I, I've not. I We run on ARM, so I don't have any problems with ARM whatsoever before. Can Mojo be used with Red Panda? Um, I don't know what Mojo is. I'm sorry. I will Google it and I'll let you know on my LinkedIn account. I will post it later, but... That's all we have for today. Thank you very much. And I hope to see you next time. I hope you find this useful. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christina, for your time today. And thank you everyone for joining us. As a reminder, this recording will be on the Linux Foundation's YouTube page later today. We hope you join us for future webinars. Have a wonderful day.